check, check. Beautiful. Okay. Someday we're just going to keep worshiping the whole time. I know I've been preparing you guys for it for a while, but it's going to happen. I want it to happen today, but I just feel like there's something. The message is, is, a, is a good one, an important one. So who knows, maybe when we're done, we'll just enter into another 45 minutes of worship. And all you people that are wondering about this crazy guy. <laughs> just keep going over the same songs over and over again sometimes. Sometimes when it's a new song like that and when it's a message that I think really feel like we need to hear, it's like I just really felt so impressed that the, vi- the victory is won. We need to take that promise to the bank and that the sacrifice of Jesus has really, has really paid for it. That's the reason the victory is won. Because a lot of times we can get caught up in just the what, that the victory is won, the victory is won, the victory is won. And pretty soon if we just repeat that over so many times without remembering the why, it just becomes powerless and hypocritical. We always have to remember why the victory is won, why we can walk in victory, why the darkness flees when we enter the room. It's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. You can turn with me to Revelation 19 today. We're going to spend almost all of our time there. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, please raise your hand and one will be delivered to you. Um, if you just want to follow along on the screen, the majority of the scriptures will be on there today. Some of them will not be, but um, they aren't in Revelation 19 either. So <laughs> good luck following me the rest of the way. Uh, God kind of restored us a little bit. Friday night was a really rough night with Lily, and uh, I was really exhausted yesterday throughout the entire day. And then we worked here, and then um, it didn't stop when I went home. It just, just felt like we just worked all night and then uh, prepped sermon and all that stuff. And I prayed as my kids went to bed. I said, God, we're losing an hour, but please restore it to me this evening somehow. Restore the rest to me somehow. And I don't even remember what happened. I just woke up on the couch at 3 in the morning, and I was just fresh. I seriously I have no idea what happened. It was just a beautiful thing. And so, well, 3 a.m. was 4 a.m., but it was 3 yesterday's time. And so I've been up since 4, like, fired up, ready to be with you guys this morning, so... Um, I don't know about you, but I'm just, I'm just all jacked up today, so I'm excited. The hour lost has not been lost to me. It's been an hour gained to me, and so I pray the same for you as well. If you're tired this morning, I will try not to put you to sleep, but no promises. Uh, we've been going through this series. Oh, I think we clicked off of it. <clears throat> Beautiful. Going through this series, Pray, Eat, Slay, and we've been going through some of the, the major battles in the, uh, in the Bible. And today we're going to end with the, with the biggest battle of all. And so we've gone through uh, Joshua. We've seen how Joshua fought his battles. Uh, we saw how Ehud uh, fought his battles, how Gideon fought his battles. But today uh, we're going to look at something a little bit different. Uh, today we're going to look at what it's like when Jesus fights. What is it like when Jesus fights? And, um, yeah, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but you can probably imagine how it goes when Jesus fights, you know, it's like, a, it's like in the movie where there's like the hero that's in the background and everyone else is kind of struggling the whole time. And then right in the last minute when the battle's getting really intense, like, like the real one shows up and everything changes. You remember in Lord of the Rings, you remember in two towers, that's my favorite, one of my favorite movies ever. And there's battles like raging all around them and like they're just about to lose. And then like Gandalf comes riding over the hill. You remember that? And it's just like white everywhere and they just like, everyone just, I don't know, gets recharged and they just win uh, really easily at that point. Like that's kind of how I picture it a little bit when Jesus shows up. Now I'm not comparing Jesus to a movie, please understand. Uh, He's much better than that. He's much greater than that as we'll see this morning. Um, But he's like, he doesn't lose you guys. He doesn't lose, ever, ever, even when it looked like he lost, even when he was dead 
and in the grave. He was in the process of winning. That's all that happens when Jesus fights. Amen? So let's look in Revelation 19, uh, maybe one of the most stunning pictures in the Bible of the God that we serve. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Picture it. The one sitting on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the picture? So you have all of the nations of the earth have gathered their armies that they're going to step up and fight against the Lamb against Jesus Christ himself. And he raises up this army and the heavens break open and it is just like a whiteness, a brightness like you've never seen before, cutting through all of the darkness, ready to proclaim his victory. And there's so much here, I, just, I wanna take it just piece by piece. It's actually gonna be the majority of the sermon because I just think it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. And so I just wanna look at these one at a time. Um, they were supposed to come up one at a time. Oh, wow, what's happening? Okay, that was weird. The first one here, faithful and true. He is faithful and true. His name, they called him faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. And we can think of all the most righteous, all the most truthful people that we've ever known. You all have someone that you maybe looked up to that was like a role model for you, and you know they just always kept their word, and they, they always seemed to do what is right, and I can just promise you that they didn't, you know? Was it George Washington never told a lie? What a lie. Of course he did. Of course he told a lie. He told lots of lies, probably. In fact, he led a whole spy ring that their whole, their whole mission was telling lies. That's all they did was tell lies. That's probably how we won the war, was because of all the lies that he told. And yet, um, we look up to him. We revere him. We would call him faithful and true. But compared to Jesus, he was a liar and unrighteous, unworthy of any praise whatsoever. Only Jesus is worthy of that. Only Jesus is faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. And I think that's important to point out in the scripture. Because we always judge. Like when someone new walks in the door, I immediately have this snap judgment of them, depending on how they look or how they're dressed or how they act or how they whatever. And my judgments are not righteous at all. I have to check my judgments at the door because I'm not righteous, and I'm not true much of the time. But Jesus, when he makes a judgment, it is righteous and it is true. And so nobody can point to Jesus like they could point to me and said, you judged unfairly. You've done me wrong. No one can ever look at Jesus and say, you've done me wrong. Because he's been only about grace. He has only been about mercy. He has only been about opportunities for forgiveness. And when it comes time for judgment and that time is over, there will be no excuse for any of us. There will be no excuse for any nation. There will be no excuse for any people. Only judgment. Righteous and perfect judgment. And we look at war. When he makes war, it is righteous. We look at the wars that we've fought as a nation over the past many years, and um, it's been maybe the primary thing that has ripped our nation in two. You look all the way back to the Vietnam War and the turmoil in the 60s. Some of you were there. I was not. But I've seen videos. 
I've done research. There was some people that thought we should be there and some people that didn't think we should be there. Some people that thought it was a righteous cause and some people thought it was a waste of lives. And there's probably truth in both of those things. You look at the Iraq War and how that ripped our nation in two over time. We were unified in the beginning, but over time we, we thought, what are the real motives here? Are we just after oil here? Are we wasting young men's lives here? And you saw this one group saying, well, this war may be righteous, and another group saying, well, this war is unrighteous. Well, when Jesus makes war, there's no question. When Jesus gets into the fight, you know that his side is correct. He is righteous every single time. There will be no discussion. There will be no debate when this day happens. When the battle of Armageddon comes down to pass, it will be righteous, 100%, because Jesus is righteous and true. Amen? Okay, faithful and true, sorry. Second one, his eyes are like a flame of fire. Now, I read a lot of different concordances on what this could possibly mean because I don't know about you, but I've just never quite seen that before. You ever seen anybody with eyes, flames of fire, like flames of fire? Maybe your mom when she was mad at you for just a minute. <laughs> that's, where my, that's where my mind went for just a second. And that could really be it. This could be when Jesus comes back, when he's returning with flames of fire, it could be that the fire is the fire of hell in his eyes, that there's damnation on the way, that there's judgment coming for his enemies. And that could very well be that no one could escape his gaze, that no one could escape the judgment of God. The other thing that I thought of is like a, a campfire or a fireplace. You ever been in that situation? You just are on the campfire and everyone's like all the s'mores are eaten and like half the people have gone to bed and you just kind of sit by the fire and it's like this mesmerizing. It's this peace, this calming that comes over you. I love that. I can't wait for that, actually. Today marks the, like the countdown, right? When the clocks change, when we can actually start to maybe have some fires here in a couple months. Our small group is like 100% outside. So you new people that haven't been a small group very long, there's fires in your future, Connie, if you keep coming to small group. Uh, we sit around the fire, we discuss Jesus, we eat some food, and uh, the kids play outside, and it's a beautiful thing. But there's that calming presence that a, just the campfire brings, isn't there? And I think, you know, that could be the fire in his eyes, the flame of fire in his eyes. And then I thought, well, couldn't it be both? Couldn't it be both? For example, this morning, there's a lot of people, if, a police, if two police officers came in here this morning, right now during service, uh, some of you would get real nervous just because of the past that you've had with police officers. I would get a little bit nervous because I've been in the back of a police car. I didn't really enjoy it that much. <clears throat> Can I get an amen? Okay, a couple of you at least. Some of you would see the police officers walk in here and you would feel a calming presence enter. Because you would know these people are here to help. These people are here to protect. When these people are here, this is a safe place. And so I think when Jesus comes back with fire in his eyes, it's, the reaction is going to be different depending on who you are. Because either he's coming to get you or he's coming to protect you one or the other. So we may look at that flame of fire in his eyes, but either way, it's interesting to see that description of him. And that's not the only time. There's two other times in Revelation where John describes Jesus as a man with fire in his eyes. He has many crowns. Many crowns. On his head are many diadems, it says. And he has a name. Oh, we'll get to that next second. Many diadems on his head. And so... Um, Diadem would be a thing like if you've seen a you've seen someone have a turban on their head, right? And so a diadem can mean two different things. It can be the ribbon that goes around the turban, and a lot of times there would be a jewel in it to signify that you were somebody important. Or it can literally be like a crown, like we think of a crown. Uh, this this word in the 
in the Greek. And so it says, when it says he is crowned with many crowns, he had many diadems on his head. And so it represents that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, that no matter what uh, earthly power that we might think that we have, that he is still Lord over that, that everybody from, you know, Donald Trump to, you know, every president and ruler in the world will have to bow down before Jesus Christ. But there's no power in anybody in this earth other than him. Throughout the book of Revelation, we see the beast. It'll talk about the beast, and it'll talk about the beast had ten horn, or seven horns with ten crowns on them and all those kinds of things. And it's this representation of the enemy. You know, the enemy tries to come and steal all this power and try to convince us that he has some kind of authority. He tries to steal the crowns that rightfully belong to the king of kings. And so when Jesus comes back, he's taking them all. He's taking everything back. And everybody will recognize him as king of kings and lord of lords. He has a name that nobody knows, it says. Name written that nobody knows. How many of you just really want to know it when it says something like that? Like, I just want to know it so bad. But uh, uh, when it talks about that, um, I just think it points to the uniqueness of Jesus. That there's something special between him and the Father that's just the inside secret just between those two. That our knowledge of him will always remain a little bit incomplete because he's infinite. And so how could we ever know everything about him? And so there's always this piece of information that's missing for us. Some of us, that's hard. Some of us, we got to wrestle with that a little bit. But, um, but it's just, he's so unique. Number five, he has a robe dipped in blood. Some debate on what this means as well. First one I think of is um, that it's his blood poured out on the cross. That it's the recognition of the sacrifice of the lamb, that this robe has been, been dipped in blood. And there's actually some argument to that. If you look at the, the actual sacrificial system in the Old Testament, a lot of times they would take the garments and actually dip them in the blood of the sacrifice in order to purify them. And so why wouldn't Jesus, taking on his heavenly garment, dip it in blood, dip it in the blood of the sacrifice in order to kind of signify that this is holy, this belongs to the Lord. And so that's one option. The other option is uh, that it's the blood of his enemies, that he treads on the blood of his enemies. And I thought of immediately all the way back in the book of Genesis. You remember the curse on Eve when it said that, uh, that the serpent would bite the heel of man and that man would crush the head of the serpent? And that was this picture of Jesus that the enemy, uh, that the devil, would continually be trying to bite at our heels, that he would co tr continually be trying to uh, defeat man. But ultimately, there would be a man that would crush the feet of the en or the, crush the head of the enemy. And so I just picture Jesus with his foot just stomping on the head of Satan and, uh, and then, you know, gets a little bit on the hem of his garment in the process just to signify this battle has been won that the victory has already been taken. And so I just look at that, and I, I think, again, both of those are the same thing to me. Either way you look at it, whether it's his own blood as a sacrifice or it's the blood of his enemies, the picture is the same. He wins. He wins. When Jesus fights, Jesus wins. He is named the Word of God. He is clothed, and his robe is dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. So earlier he was called faithful and true, and now he is called the Word of God. In the beginning, it says in John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. Not anything was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. And so we see at the beginning of creation, remember God spoke, and everything came into existence. 
When John writes his gospel, he writes about Jesus and said, Jesus was there at the beginning. Jesus was that word. When God spoke, Jesus was the word, and all things came into being. There was not anything that was made without Jesus. It blows my mind, you guys, to just consider that scripture from John. How incredible. How amazing. Lastly, he's the leader of the armies of heaven. The armies of heaven arrayed, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And I think of the armies of heaven, and how did they become white and pure? Jesus. It's his presence. It's his blood. It's his cleansing. So the whole army kind of takes after him. He came on a white horse and a white robe, and everyone that follows him comes on a white horse and in a white robe, ready to battle in his name. I love that. It says, verse 15, we'll come back to a couple of those things here. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of, his, of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. See, the battle's not really a battle. The battle of Armageddon isn't really much of a battle. It's just the realization of how things are supposed to be. See, I think the battle is just the same as creation. You look at the, the Lord's Prayer. says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. I believe that the battle of Armageddon is just the final outcome of that prayer for Jesus. He says, your, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. When that was spoken, I believe, things were set into motion. Final playing out in the battle of Armageddon. This is not Jesus like trying to fight against darkness and he just barely overcomes it. This is heaven invading earth for the final time. Darkness cannot fight against light. Jesus just has overwhelming victory and this prayer that we've all probably prayed a hundred times is answered for the final time. Heaven invades earth. And it's over in a second. Just like when God spoke at creation, everything was created in a second. When Jesus comes, when the word comes into the battle, everything is changed in a second. And the victory is totally and completely won. Jesus speaks. And it's over. Here it is. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly overhead. Fly directly overhead. Come. Come. Gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And so the angel doesn't come and say, oh, come and join the battle. Jesus needs your help. That's not what happens when Jesus fights. He doesn't really need much help. He doesn't need any help. He just wins. That's all Jesus does is win. And so he comes, and, it says, and the angel says, we're going to feast on the flesh of the enemies, and he lists all these different ones. And the point here is from the greatest to the least. It would be a king, be the leader of a nation, okay? The king would be the greatest in a nation. It says he's going to have to bow down. He's going to be judged. Then it goes to a captain, a captain in Roman times was a, pers was, a, was a person who led a thousand people in the army. They always broke it down into tens in the Roman army. So you'd have a one person that would lead ten, and then you have a, a person that would lead a hundred. He'd live, lead ten people below him, and then you had a captain that would lead ten groups of a hundred. So the king's going to have to 
uh, face judgment. The captain faces judgment. The mighty man. Maybe this is a great warrior in the army. He's going to bow down and be judged. The flesh of horses and their riders. So this would be someone noble enough to own a horse to ride around. He's going to have to be judged. Then it's all of the free men. And so in Rome, you were a free man. You had the right to vote. Uh, that was a great honor. And so you were placed above everyone else if you were a free man in Rome. And the lowest of the low in Rome were the slaves. But when Jesus comes, when judgment comes, it doesn't matter who you are. From the greatest to the least, from the biggest to the smallest, everyone will be judged. Y'all see that? Total victory over everybody. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army, and the beast was captured. And with the false prophet who, it, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And so we see in this final battle of Armageddon, the sword that comes from Jesus' mouth. That's, I just think it's just the word. I just look at it and I just see Jesus spoke. It was like they had this army, the, the evil forces gathered all this army and the beast and the, uh, who, who, who were the two here? Sorry, I lost it. The beast and the kings of the earth and the false prophet. They're all gathered up. They have their army. They think, hey, we really got a chance at this thing. And they like get geared up and then Jesus comes and he just speaks and all of a sudden they're captured. Have you ever played uh, Defend Your Castle? Sorry, I don't know. It's just the first thing I thought of. Have you ever heard of that game? No? Okay, good. Uh, so Defend Your Castle is like this silly, stupid computer game, okay? And these stick figures run at your castle, and then you click with your mouse, and you can pick them up. And as soon as you pick them up, all their legs and arms go, they're like, ah, what's going on? Ah. And they don't know what happened. Like, you don't have any weapons. It's like this invisible hand just came and, like, picks them up, and they're like, ah. And then you throw them up really high, and then they, like, go on the ground, and it's just like blood. You know, they just die. It's fantastic. It's hilarious. <laughs> Y'all need to try it. I feel like you've deprived yourselves for too long. Go home and play Defend Your Castle and picture the Battle of Armageddon when you do it. But it was like they were all geared up. They were ready to go, and then all of a sudden they were just picked up. Ah! The beast and the false prophet. This is actually a picture of it right here. <laughs> so I think the blue one there is the beast, and number two. No. Nah. It's kind of funny. There is like a pool of like where you can turn them into your people. So I just picture like pick them up and drop them in there into final judgment. But that's how it happened. I mean, it was just like it was just over in a moment. They thought they were going to fight. They thought there was going to be this big battle. And then all of a sudden the beast and false prophet are captured. Jesus speaks one word and everyone's dead. Because Jesus just wins. That's all Jesus does. This I thought was interesting. Um, just a little bit before that. Revelation chapter 12. Now war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place in heaven, any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And so this is a picture kind of almost before, before time, it, it would seem, that there was this battle in heaven. And so Satan rose up against God with a third of the angels in heaven to have this uprising. And God allows Michael to fight on his behalf, and they win. And they throw the enemy down into the earth. Then it says this. 
I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And so as soon as the enemy was able to be in, in, on the earth and able to work among the people of God, uh, then it says the salvation and power of our God was there. So it's like God just chased down the enemy with Jesus Christ, right from the get. It says, The brethren have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And so as soon as he was thrown down, he knew that final judgment was coming. He knew it right from then. And so he tries with all his might to mess us up. He tries with all his might to discourage you, to deceive you, to have you believe lies about yourself or about the world, to have you believe that that battle is not actually won, to have you believe that the blood has not actually covered your sin, to have you believe that you are still caught in God's judgment, even if you are his child. But how do we win? The same way Jesus won. By the blood and by the word. Remember, he came, that cloth and his clothing dipped in blood. It was already, the victory was already there. The sacrifice was already made. The war was already won. And then he spoke a word, and everybody was gone. That's how we win, too. We need to take on the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to speak his words of victory. And we can win, too. Sorry, just one more time. So which side will you fight on? How will you respond? We have Joshua, we saw Joshua, Ehud, Gideon, they all fought their battles. They all won their battles because Jesus was on their side. Because they fought, they fought from the recognition of the blood and the word, the promises of God. We saw Joshua and through the book of Judges that when they chose to fight on their own, they lived in defeat. Remember the battle of Ai? You remember the judges every time that they would turn away from God? Defeat over the land. You don't want to be on the wrong side of these battles. And I beg you to take this word seriously today. This battle in Revelation is going to happen. And it's going to happen in a moment. And it's probably going to happen in a way and at a time that we don't really expect. See, it's not going to happen like that, probably. It's going to happen totally different than what we can think or imagine. Because Jesus came in a way that the Israel didn't recognize. And so there may be signs happening around us right now that we don't fully recognize. Jesus said, come like a thief in the night. This world we live in will end, and its end will be violent and bloody. There will be judgment. We may live to see that play out. Or we could die today. Either way, you have to be prepared. You need to be prepared. If you're living a life apart from Jesus, if you're fighting this battle called life without him on your side, you are fighting a losing battle. And it will not turn out well for you. You need to be his. You need to be on his side. Let's just bow our heads. Just with everybody's eyes closed, is there anybody in here that just says, I've been living my life in my own power. I don't want to do that anymore. 
I want to li- I want to fight on Jesus' side. If that's to you, if you would just raise your hand real high. Is there anyone else that has that testimony today saying, I've fought this battle too long on my own. I want to fight on Jesus' side. I need his power. I need his victory. Anybody else? Amen. Okay, you can put your hands down. Let's pray. Father God, for the hands that I saw raised this morning, Lord, We just give your simple, simple gospel. Lord, you've called us to do two things in order to get on your side of the battle. Lord, first you've called us to repent. That just means to change our mind and to go another way. And so, Lord, we've changed our mind this morning. We're saying, I don't want to fight this battle on my own anymore. Jesus, I need you. I'm sorry for the way that I've lived before, and I want to live a different life. The second thing that you call us to do, Lord, is to believe. To believe in you. To believe that you really did die for our sins. To believe that you really did suffer for what I have done. That you have taken my place in God's judgment. And Lord, we really do believe that you have been raised from the dead. That as you were raised to new life, we are now raised to new life. And we can live differently. If that's you this morning and you raised your hand, I just uh, implore you to seek out other people. Tell them that you've repented today, that you've believed today. And ask for, the, ask for the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit to come in your life in power, that you could walk a different life that you could live a different life, that the words that come out of your mouth could be words of life, and that you will have ultimate victory in Jesus' name. Father, for everybody else, Lord, I just pray that we would live our lives with the knowledge that you're going to come back at any moment, that today could be the last day, that this might be the last opportunity I have to call and ask forgiveness for the people that I need to ask forgiveness from that this might be my last opportunity to do the thing that you've called me to do and so that I should not delay, that I should press forward with all that you've called me to do, that we should not live our lives for the things of this world, that we should not be distracted, that we should not be discouraged, but that we should walk forward in victory and in power in everything you've called us to do. God, I pray that over every person in this place. Lord, that we would be living testimonies to what you can do with broken people when they turn to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.